this so. is your graduating moment. Sorry, like this is the the level up of your life right here, y'all. Yeah, this is um this is where things start getting real. <laughs> and everything starts getting a little bit more complex. Yeah. Am Sorry, I ready for this, David? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I think don't know, I don't know. you might have enough. to get a new phone. <laughs> I don't think I got just enough. You say so, whatever we've been through is not real. <laughs> um, yeah, it's this is auth is a fun experience. Um, so just to like usually there this is like a marathon session that we do like on Monday and we all end the day and everyone is just looking and everyone has this terrible blank face and everyone feels miserable and none of us have had any fun. Um, so this is the first time we're actually splitting it up over two days. Hopefully we don't feel as bad tomorrow and when we hopefully have wrapped this up by lunch. Uh, we'll see how far we get, but that is going to be our goal. So um, at the end of this lecture, uh, the end result of this, uh, I will be giving all of you a link to a template that is going to replace your uh, express generator replacement that we've been using for the last week. Uh, and we will now start using uh, essentially this new uh, implementation that has auth included in it. So the code that is presented to you as part of this lecture, while it is important and you should pay attention and you should kind of understand what it does, if you don't, just know that you're never going to have to write it again in this class. <laughs> so. All of it's going to be given to you, and I don't want you freaking out because we're going over a ton of code, and you're like, I don't understand what a quarter of this is doing. That is okay. Um, auth is something wildly confusing. It is not particularly fun to have to do, uh, but the people that manage auth stuff get paid a lot of money. So it's nice to be able to at least have a passing familiarity with how this auth stuff works and have code that you can look back on and have this lecture you can rewatch in the future so that you are able to better understand how authentication works. So um, again, I just want to put you a little bit at ease. Like if you don't understand the code that is going on as we're going through that, that is okay. Just to clarify, it says um, with an email address you feel appropriate to be shared on the internet. It, if like if I have a basic, you know, jonathan.n.herman at gmail.com that I use, is this yeah. supposed to be like a throwaway email or is that okay to use? That is totally fine to use. Um, essentially where this is going to appear is going to be, um, it, it's going to appear on a page that is very similar to this one that we're looking at over here on the right. Uh, so say I was to sign up with Notion. This is what we're talking about when we're saying OAuth, by the way. Um, so essentially these continue with Google, continue with Apple, this kind of stuff here, this is OAuth. So we will be implementing OAuth in our applications. Uh, so if I come in here and I sign up with Google, uh, what this is going to say is that I need to sign in. Uh, so, uh, whenever it says something you feel appropriate to be shared on the internet, uh, you will see that whenever uh, you click on continue to Notion here, you can click on this and the email shows up here. That is the, that is how someone is going to see this email address, is if they go through that same process. The likelihood of anyone clicking on the name of your app to be able to pull up the developer info is like wildly nothing. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done this before for any reason, but your email will be listed there. So if you don't feel comfortable with using your email address and having it shown up here, whenever someone clicks on sign in, then make sure that you are using a different email address. Okay. So again, this is OAuth. So OAuth essentially, allows people to sign into your application using their existing accounts. So no password is created uh, whenever they do this. All you're doing is associating a uh, account on 
one end with an existing account on Google's end. So in this case, Notion is saying, cool, you're using a Google account. I'm going to store your Google ID, and then I'm going to use that Google ID to uh, make sure everything is good with Google and to keep you logged in. So that is OAuth. Just so that there's no confusion around that. Um, so as part of this lecture, uh, you'll be able to understand the difference between authentication and authorization. We're also going to identify the advantages and disadvantages that OAuth provides users and businesses. Uh, we're also going to explain what happens whenever a user clicks on login with insert OAuth provider here. Uh, we are also going to eventually add in OAuth to an Express app using Passport.js. Uh, this will likely not happen until tomorrow. Just throwing that out there. A lot of today is going to be us uh, screwing around on uh, cloud.developers.google.com and also creating certificates on our end, I hope. We'll see how far we get. Uh, whenever we do get to talking about uh, our Express app and using Passport, we're also going to use middleware and Passport.js to implement authorization. So um, as part of your setup today, make sure that you're signed into or have created a Google account that is not owned by an organization with an email address that you feel <clears throat> appropriate to share on the internet. Excuse me. So we could use our email, right? You're absolutely cool to use your email, your primary email, if that's what you want. All right. Um, also, um, as part of this lecture, make sure that your machine is in a state where you are able to restart it. So if you have a bunch of tabs open, uh, the next break that we do, I want you to go through and archive those, make sure you bookmark things, whatever you want to save, get your machine to a place where you're able to restart your machine. All right. So to actually get started, we are going to clone down the SEI students GitHub repo into the lectures directory on your local machine. Then we're going to move into this directory. You're going to install the node modules. You're going to open this in VS Code. And you're going to come in here. And once we have this open in VS Code, you're going to want to touch a .env file. And then we're going to need a database underscore URL set equal to a value that I'm about to provide you. Should we record this? Uh, it's cool. All of these are bad. All right. Um, cool. So here we are. I will send this in Slack. So that goes into your database URL. All right, everybody with me. Anyone need me to stop or slow down or wait? Did you put that in the Slack, you said? It is in Slack, yes. I believe. Yes, it's in Slack. It's like I sent it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about Google OAuth with Express and Passport.
All right, so we're going to start off and talk about authentication. So we need authentication because uh, whenever we're talking about our uh, application, all of our functionality is almost always going to result, revolve around a user and that user's actions. So uh, for example, whenever you use online baking or more importantly, save songs to Spotify playlist, the application knows who you are. And that's why we need authentication. Authentication allows an application to identify the per person that is using that application. We'll have three different authentication strategies in this course. The first one in unit two is the most complex, OAuth. In unit three, uh, we will talk about token-based. Uh, we'll use JSON web tokens uh, to be able to uh, keep track of uh, users and have username and password login that way. Then in unit four, we'll have session-based username and password login instead of token-based. We'll get to those later though. For now, we're talking OAuth. So authentication and authorization are not going to be the same things. Authentication verifies the user's identity and authorization determines what functionality that authenticated user has access to. Sorry, so, David, can you repeat this again? Yeah, so authentication and authorization, those are different things. Authentication is what is going to verify that a user is who that they say they are. Authorization is going to determine what functionalities on your site that users are able to access. So authorization is what features a logged in user has versus a user that's not logged in. Uh, your authorization is also what, uh, essentially what roles does a user have? Is, is a role an admin? Are they a user? Are they a super admin that has access to literally everything in your application? Uh, are they a support user? Like there's all kinds of different roles that a user can have in an application. And those would just be built out dependent on the functionality of that application. You think of it as like a clearance level. Yeah, 100%. President could do things that a junior analyst can't do. So would like authorization be like read only, like read write, like that, like those kinds of things? Authorization, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I see cool. is like um, in some movie, like you oh author uh authen what is it, authenticate um whoever, like long Essex. And then authorization is more like um, who you are, kind of, right? If you're a manager, if you're... Um... Authentication determines what the user's identity is. So mm -hmm. it determines that this person, like I am me, whenever I am logged into this website, and uh, I might have more uh, access roles than like you have, okay. for example. So that would be the authorization. Uh, you can also kind of think of this as like uh, in Notion even. So like in Notion, uh, you all have this thing in the bottom left that says that you're all guests. Um, whereas like I have the authorization to come in here and I can like change things and I can, you know, delete things and I can import things. I can do all of this stuff that you all can't do because of your role and what you're authorized to do inside of this application. So uh, why do we use OAuth? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of different reasons uh, from the business side and from the user side. So essentially, whenever we're talking about this, when you have a, a login, 
uh, and you have to log into a site with the username and password, what are the pitfalls of that from a user's perspective? I'm off mute, we'll talk about it. Like if they forget their password, like that type 100%, of- 100%, yeah. Or username, whatever. Making yeah. too many because you keep forgetting. 100%. Also, also much less secure. Yeah. As in having the same password for- Yeah, there days. we go, yep. Cool. What else? Anything? I imagine it's like uh, people don't want to have to do that <laughs> also. That, yeah, 100%. Your users want to just click a button. They don't want to have to keep track of passwords. They don't want to have to type things in. They like, the, give me what I want. <laughs> That's what your users want. Anything else? Cool. So I think you all covered most of the points in here. Um, so for example, if the user has multiple logins, then the user has to remember and manage all of those logins, right? Um, but users often don't bother doing that. Um, so they are inherently insecure and they are compromising themselves whenever they're using the same passwords over and over. So using OAuth is a way for users to not have to do that. Um, also, users will typically use weak passwords as well. They don't create strong passwords by default. And that's so that they are able to actually remember them. Uh, so that's the consumer side. What about business side? What are the pitfalls of username and password auth? They have to like the businesses have to juggle all these like sensitive informations of all these people, and if there's like a data breach, then they're in hot water. One hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I guess kind of along the same thing I said last time. Like businesses also are aware that they'll lose a lot of people who like click on their site and then go, "Oh, I don't want to sign up," and then they'll just dip. Yeah, totally. Adding friction and much more liability. Kind of putting the... Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was going to say you're putting the verification on just like yourself versus with the OAuth, you're allowing this other secondary thing to be the verifier. Yeah, 100%. Like you as a business don't have the means to go out and make sure that like your users are who they say they are. Like anyone can come onto a site and make a username and password. Like Whereas Google can have a lot of flexibility in like, oh, this user is attached to this phone number whenever they're doing a log a sign up process. So they can say, hey, we have this user and they're attached to this phone number. Anything else? Cool. So I think you all hit on most of it again. Um, so managing user's credential is very, very sensitive. Uh, you're, you know, messing with a lot of user data there. Uh, and what's in those accounts, like the apps that we're building, like sure, we're, we have a movie database and that's kind of whatever. Um, but whenever we're talking about a real world application, like a bank, uh, I'll, that's an entire, like person's life is tied up into like that bank account potentially. So uh, all of that code has to be extremely secure. It has to be written by people that get paid lots and lots and lots and lots of money to be able to make sure that it's secure. So uh, you have a lot of work to do with the, on that end. Uh, as Dylan said, customers don't want to have to make accounts, essentially. You're adding friction to that user experience. Uh, that is especially true for er entertainment or personal interest websites. Um, unless you're providing some like exclusive service, it's really, really hard to get a user to sign up for a website. If you're just providing news or something like that, 
users can go lots and lots and lots of different websites for news. So that's probably what they're going to do rather than make an account on yours. Um, also, managing those credentials does make your business a target for attackers. If, tar if attackers know, hey, this is a very secure, you know, like that, that we've got a bank that we could rob here, those credentials are very, very valuable. And so that makes it a really big target, both for internal and external uh, attackers internal being employees. So there, we have a lot of benefits about OAuth, um, but we do have a couple of potential pitfalls um, to OAuth. So what do you all think these might be from a user's perspective? Before I knew what OAuth was, I used to never use it because I was like, I don't want this company to know my Google username. Like, they're going to send me a bunch of shit that I don't want. Like, totally. Uh, maybe you don't have a Google account. Hey, there you go. 100%. I kind of take, I mean, I don't know if this, this feels like it's in the minority, but I kind of take the approach that if, if I rely strictly on OAuth, if my OAuth account is hacked, then all my accounts are open. 100%. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. You better have a really, really, really strong password on that main OAuth account or man, you could be in a world of hurt real easily and you better not use that password anywhere else. Then there's just like the big bro brother thing where everything's always listening to you. So Google has access to everything that you log into. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. I think you all hit most of it there. Um, so kind of to Dylan's point that you just made, by using that OAuth provider, we are subject to vendor lock-in with Google. Suddenly, whenever we are using sign in with Google everywhere, our Google account becomes wildly, wildly necessary for us to have. We can't ever get rid of our Google account because then we can't sign into Notion. We can't sign into, uh, uh, gosh, uh, we can't sign into like Evernote, something like that. We are totally locked out of all of the accounts. So we have to retain that Google account ownership or we're screwed because <laughs> now we can't get into anything. Uh, also, that OAuth provider gets a lot of user data about what sites is you know my user logging into out on the internet. Google gets all of that information. They're going to see, oh, this user is a member of this site. They're probably likely, if you're using Gmail, something like that, they're going to have um, essentially they're going to have the oh my gosh, wow, I'm totally blanking. Woo. Um, they're going to have access to everything that you're logging into. Uh, if you have like Gmail or something like that, they probably have access to that anyway. Uh, but it makes it very, very difficult to, you know, separate out your data and say, hey, I don't want my OAuth provider knowing everything I do on the internet. Um, also, whenever we're thinking about this, the support process can get more difficult as well. Uh, so an example of this is like sign in with Apple. Um, so for example, whenever you do sign in with Apple, you have the ability in that to be able to associate your account with a different email than the account that your Apple account is tied to. So whenever your users call in for support and the first question you're going to ask as a support person, whenever you're dealing with a user problem is, you know, how, how what is our relationship to you? What is your email address? And the user, if they're making a bunch of these uh, like kind of quote unquote fake emails everywhere across the internet, 
they're not going to know potentially what your what their email address is that they've made for your site because it's being funneled through this process of like, hey, this fake account is linked up to my real account, but I don't actually know the address of this fake account because Apple's just creating it on their end and they're sending it off to this OAuth or this OAuth user. So that support process gets more difficult potentially. Uh, what about what are some pitfalls from a website uh, business's perspective? Speaking from experience, it is a pain in the ass to set up and to fix if it breaks. We had it break for like four minutes and we got like 1,800 emails because of it. Sounds about right. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool. So whenever we use OAuth as developers or as a business, we're entering a extremely one-sided agreement with this company. We are entering into an agreement with Google and we need Google the Google does not in any way need us. <laughs> so you're basically at their whim and they can cut you off at any time. And if they cut you off, you lose all of your users because all of your users are logging in using this OAuth process. And if Google one day says, eh, we're not about this anymore and revokes your access for whatever reason, because they can make all the decisions, you end up without users for your application. Sounds pretty bad. Uh, also, uh, you're essentially trading off one headache, uh, to Zach's point, like building that secure authentication and storage system and again, like pretty much every site that we go to still builds out these things anyway, they still build their own login systems. Uh, but instead you have to build out a complex login system that interacts with third party systems and data structures. So again, this kind of goes back on Google can change anything at any time that they want. They can change the signup process for this. They can change the APIs for this. They can change all of it whenever. So us as developers have to keep up with all of those things. So uh, those are just a couple of points to think about uh, whenever you're considering implementing OAuth inside of your applications, uh, but we are going to uh, learn about OAuth and how to implement it. So uh, just to run through this real quick, uh, we've got some quick vocabulary here at the start. So uh, we will be using OAuth 2.0. That is the current OAuth standard. Uh, version one is going to uh, be, or is obsolete at this point, and you should not be using it. Uh, our OAuth provider is a service company such as Google that makes their service available to applications. Uh, we have clients, uh, that's us. We have owners. Uh, they, this is the person that has the account with our OAuth provider. So whenever we click on sign in with Google, we are the owners. Uh, we also have resources. Uh, those are whatever information the owner has decided to share with us, the client application. Uh, the access tokens, these are essentially going to provide access to those owner's resources. Uh, that allows us to uh, essentially access things like we are going to be accessing the user's name, their avatar, their email address, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that is the scope. All right, so. Uh, there are lots and lots of OAuth providers out there uh, Facebook, Google, GitHub, Twitter, Apple, so, 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 so many more. We can click on this link that goes off to Wikipedia and we see that there's just a ton in here. Uh, 
lots and lots of OAuth providers. Cool. So let's talk about the flow of OAuth. Uh, although we are using Google, uh, you can see that this chart here is really, really sad and kind of doesn't do a great job of explaining exactly what's going on. So I'm going to be using this Dropbox uh, example instead. So the flow of this is the user is going to press on the connect or in our place, the sign in with Google button. Uh, it's going to, our app is going to redirect that user to uh, Google's web page, And the user is going to log into their Google account and they're going to authorize our application to use that Google account. And Google is going to redirect us back to the app using the redirect URI that we give it. Uh, it's the same thing for Google there. And then our app is going to exchange the authorization code uh, that uh, has that reusable access token. That part's not visible to the user, but it still is what is tying all of this stuff together and allowing us to actually use all of this information from Google. All right, so uh, I feel like we covered those top two pretty well. Uh, true or false, if your site allows users to authenticate via OAuth, you should ensure they create a strong password. False, they won't have a password. Yeah, 100%. Great question, yay. All right. And what is the client application within the context of an OAuth provider? Google eh. or whoever the provider is. Uh, our web application. Yeah, there we go. Our web application is going to be the client in this situation. So to us, like, or to our users, our, we're, they're connecting to our server but our server can also be a client and our client is going to connect to Google's servers. So even though we as users call our servers servers, they're to Google's perspective going to be clients. All right. So, uh, talk about the app that we're going to be building, uh, probably not today, but more tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be taking a uh, starting application and we're going to be adding in OAuth and authorization to it. Uh, and this application is going to allow you to see a fun list about yourself. Um, and also read about fellow students in the past, although we have a new database layout this time, so you actually aren't going to view information about students in the past, sorry about that. Um, also, the app is going to add you as a student to its database whenever you log in, just automatically, you're going to be uh, added as a student. So, we have a couple of user stories. Uh, we have a couple of those complete in the starter code. So as a user, I want to view fun facts. Uh, there are no fun facts for you to see, unfortunately. Um, but we'll still have the second fun thing instead, which is I want to be able to search for students by their name. So I don't have to scroll through a long list. So that part is going to be done for us. Uh, we are going to be completing the other uh, user stories here. So as an authenticated student, I want to learn fun facts about myself so that I can uh, amuse others. I want to add fun facts about myself. I want to be able to delete a fact about myself in case I embarrass myself. Uh, and then as part of the level up, uh, there's going to be the ability to uh, view the Google avatar instead of a placeholder icon uh, in the template that I'm going to give you all that already has that functionality all in place. So uh, our starter code, uh, 
this app has been scaffolded using uh, eGen replacement. There's only one server side view that is students index. Uh, you'll see that this is built out using bootstrap and it's got a lot going on in here. And we're going to be adding a little bit more. Uh, a lot of this is related specifically, like almost all of this is for nav stuff. Uh, you'll see that it's really about half and half. We've got our page down here after line 60. Uh, this is just going to display a card for each one of our students that has been logged in. Uh, and then also up here, and you can see the nav. Uh, all of this stuff is going to have a bunch of bootstrap classes on it. Uh, don't let all of this class stuff get too intimidating to you. It's just bootstrap. That's what we've got going on here. All right. So uh, you also know that the app currently isn't going to launch. Uh, we also have this .env that we just created. Uh, so this is going to provide our environment variables, such as our database connection string. We're going to be adding a ton more to this after this process. Uh, this env file, again, is not going to be pushed to GitHub. Uh, and the key value pairs in this are going to be uh, attached to process.env. That happens on line one of server.js, right here. Uh, then on line, not three, but 14. Uh, Oh, no, that's correct. Line three of config database is going to be using those environment variables. Config database, line three, right here. Mongoose connect. So we're using this process.env.database URL, just like we've been using for a bit now. And that is going to use this connection string. You'll note that since we're all using the same database, we all have access to the same information. And we'll all be making calls onto the same database. We'll be creating records on the same database. We'll be doing all of the same stuff on the same database. Um, all right. We're using, as I just said, a shared MongoDB Alice database. Uh, we are able to search as well. Uh, I'm not going to take time showing you how search is implemented. Um, know that if you do want to implement search in your app, you can use this application as kind of a reference for how you might go about doing that. Uh, talked about the EJS already. Uh, there is a couple of models in here. This is going to be probably one of the more complicated parts of this. So first off, we have a user model in user.js. All of this is right now is going to be an email. And it's also going to hold a reference to our student. And then in our student model, this holds a lot of our student information. So in here, we have a name, we have an avatar, and we have facts. This fact schema is up here. All that is inside of it is text. It's just going to be a string. Uh, and this is an embedded resource inside of our student schema. All right. So those are our two models. And we'll be messing with both of them whenever we create users. All right. Currently have two routes in here. We have an index route. All this does is redirect to slash students, which renders this student's index view. We also have slash students, and then we have controllers for these. So we can add a fact, 
we can delete a fact. And we also have our index. If we go and look at that controller, this index, uh, this little bit here is what is essentially coming in and uh, building out our search query. Uh, so that is what that is doing. All right, and then uh, that's our controller. Uh, you'll also notice that as part of this, since we're using Google OAuth, on our local environments, we are going to need to create HTTPS servers. And so far, we've been using HTTP. Uh, so on our local environments, we are going to need HTTPS servers instead. That'll be a fun adventure we'll all go through together so that we can actually create an HTTP server that is valid on our local machines. Uh, again, so far we've just been using HTTP. Um, you can see that there's a few notes in this. I'm not going to dive too much into uh, how all of this is going to work, but essentially uh, just know that when we, whenever we are in development, we are one, going to want to run our environment in HTTPS so that we're able uh, to set our Google OAuth application set to production. And then we're, when we're in production, Heroku is going to manage certificates for us. So whenever we're in production, we run our app using HTTP. Uh, that's just how Heroku is going to want it. They want us running in HTTP, and then they manage the HTTPS side of this. This still works for all of our needs, though. So we're, we're going to be good. All right. Anyone have any questions about this app? Very good. I'm going to send you all on a 11 minute break. I'll see you back at five after. <laughs> 